I wanted to start out thanking Jeremy for accompanying me in this. I actually had a surgery a few weeks ago, and I knew about this event, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to carry the, the whole uh, moment by myself, and so I co-opted my friend Jeremy to kind of help me through this just in case. Um, so if anyone's wondering why Jeremy is here. <laughs> I also find Jeremy to be one of the best interviewers around, and so this will be, this will be fun. Mm, set a low bar. <laughs> set a way lower bar. <laughs> this will be fun. So when Robin reached out to me, my first reaction was, oh, good, we get to do this again yes. um, because they tend to be a lot of fun. Then I just found out we're being recorded. <laughs> So it's going to be less fun today. Um, but then my second thought anytime she asked me to do this is how much I hate her when she asked me to do this. <laughs> and the reason is I always have to start and kind of tell everyone what her background is. And I remember the first time that, that we had ever met, um, you were actually going to speak in one of my classes and I was looking at your resume and I actually called my wife and, and I said, I don't really know what I'm doing in my life. <laughs> like we're not too far apart in age and look at what she's done and look at what I've done and they don't really match. So instead of putting myself through that again, I'm actually gonna let Robin tell you what she's done. So if you don't mind just kind of painting the roadmap for everybody of your career, and then we'll kind of fill in the blanks as we kind of go on. Perfect, and so I'll give sort of the career highlights and then hopefully we'll get into the rest because I think the more interesting part is probably the messy, complicated, um, you know, the, the rest of the flavor of life. Um, so I am from a really small town in Northwest Florida. Um, so a small town girl, and when I was 11, I had the chance to travel to Germany with my family. And it was my first time outside of the US, it was probably my first time out of the Southeast U US, and I was hooked. I was so excited to see different cultures, this awareness that like people live their lives really different ways. And from the time I was 11, I just had this thing inside of me that said, the world is really, really big and I wanna be a part of it. And so I think from that point on, the rest of my life was just like, how do I get to be a part of this really big, amazing, awesome, confusing, scary, beautiful world that we live in. Um, so when I was in high school, I worked for $1.74 an hour at Baskin Robbins Ice Cream in my little <laughs> town. <laughs> and I saved money to go on a school trip to Russia, which was the Soviet Union still. And so I went to Leningrad, not St. Petersburg, and Moscow. And I was even more hooked that my whole life needs to be about that. So that was my junior year of high school. So then obviously when I'm a senior applying, I was, well, the Russia trip was... Um, during November and December. <laughs> and uh, I froze to death the whole time I was there. And so the next year I was applying to schools and I said, I want to go to the best school that doesn't get a lot of snow. <laughs> and, so, and so that was honestly like one of the big decision points for coming to Duke as an undergrad. Um, so I came to Duke and I studied everything I could that was international um, and learned a lot and grew a lot and did all of these interesting things at the university. And then went on to pursue a PhD that's in international economics and politics, a lot of decision sciences, game theory, taught at a university for a little while, and then uh, kind of said, you know what? I've got a lot of knowledge in my head, but I had very little experience under my feet. I was about 26 when I finished my PhD and I started teaching at Georgia Tech. And so I was like, I need to go get some stuff under me because as I'm explaining it to other people, it's not as meaningful if I don't have the experience there. So. One of my favorite phrases is, well, how hard could that be? And so, so I was like, well, I'll go get a corporate job. How hard could that be? <laughs> someone with zero experience, someone with like zero um, knowledge about what I was walking into. And somehow it worked out um, with a lot of hard work and luck, like everything else in life. And I started working for a multinational corporation in the international division. With them, I ended up spending a year in Tel Aviv. Um, I traveled around a lot. I moved to Argentina and spent some time in Argentina with them, traveling all over Latin America and helping run, run businesses there. Um, while I was in Argentina, um, they sold all the companies to somebody from Spain, and I was not finished with my Argentine adventure yet. And so I was like, I don't want to move back to the US. So I stayed in Argentina, switched, started working for a big consumer goods company, uh, again, based in Argentina and running things around the region was sitting there for a little while and kind of said, okay, I think maybe I'm ready for my next move. And they said, well, where would you like to go? And one of the options was Hong Kong. 
So I moved from Argentina to Hong Kong. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have been to Argentina and Hong Kong, but those are two totally different universes. Um, so I moved from Argentina to Hong Kong. Again, how hard could this be? Um, and moved to Hong Kong, ran a business there for Hong Kong and South China for about three years. And after being out of the US for 10 years total, uh, moved back to the US, biggest culture shock of my life, moving back to the US after being gone for 10 years. And um, Duke found me again in Hong Kong, actually. And so I started doing some talks with Fuqua and some of the work that they were doing in Shanghai. And um, when I got back to the US, someone from Fuqua called and, called and said, hey, you know that talk that you give? Do you think you could turn that into a class about cross-cultural leadership and what is it like to work in different places and how do you adapt to cultures and run businesses differently in different parts of the world? That's how Jeremy and I met. And uh, so did that for a few years while I was doing my, my day job, which is now at a big data and analytics company. And um, I guess that's kind of where I am now. After, after university, I started, uh, I started writing. And so that's where the book came from. And I have a blog site at gutsy.world. I write with Forbes.com now. And I do a lot of mentoring for entrepreneurs and startups. Um, so I think that's what I'm doing now. See, so here's why it's I don't, just that. Here, here's why I don't <laughs> like this. <laughs> Even the Baskin Robbins, so that you can go to Russia while you were in high school. I worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken and bought beer. Because <laughs> <laughs> that one I didn't know before. So, anyway, um, you kind of talk through that entire arc, which is very different than mine. Um, and it seems like there's an intention to it. Like, it, it almost seems like when you were in high school, you kind of knew this is what you were going to do, the, the step from going to Russia to having you know, a more international type education, to getting into companies that give you all this international plus inner, inner kind of functional exposure. Is that the right assessment? Did you pretty much know what the path was? It's completely planned every single step <laughs> of the way. No, of course not. Life is messy and it's weird and it goes all over the place. And people ask about my career, I'm like, it's very nonlinear. It's very sort of all over the map and all over the place, but it's interesting, and the thread that connects it is the international part, because that's what I really love. But my career is all over the place, and I think the one thing that I always look at is there's a bit of this, um, I called it stupidity, and someone said, you know, it's really more naivete. I was like, <laughs> okay, fine. Um, but they said, they said I, really it's this, how hard could that be? Oh, well, how hard could that be to create a whole course at a university? <laughs> how hard could that be to move to some different continent where I don't know anyone? How hard could that be? So I think it's this like this um, naivete <laughs> that has led to all of these different kinds of experiences. And I think what happens is they sort of build on each other. And once you've done one thing, and then you can do something else that's kind of adjacent, and then you can do something else, and then every now and then you just jump into the deep end again and figure it out, and you swim. So I don't think it's been intentional. Um, and I think it's that whole Steve Jobs looking backwards, you can connect the dots, but definitely it hasn't been connecting the dots looking forward, at least for most of the time. So one of the pieces that I find so fascinating with that is that your view on you know, really finding what, what matters in your life, and then on top of that, you have this kind of personal leadership that's the heart of your book, is you actually do speak to this idea of you, you don't just get to, you kind of have to be intentional with your life, yeah. um, which is just, you know, just keeps resonating with me since, since I first met you, but then since I first read the book uh, about a year ago. But it, you know, right now especially, and when I first met you, there was an intention, yes. um, you know, probably about five years ago, yeah. that it felt like it, 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 it had happened and, and this change of, of, of view had happened for you. Were you aware when that happened? Did you, did, was that a you know, conscious shift? Was that a, wait, I get to choose? What, what did that transformation kind yeah, of look like? Yeah, so I think for me what, what happened was um, I always had that travel part in there. And then I was in a moment of real personal crisis. Um, I was married, I'm not married anymore. I was in the middle of that whole not being married anymore process um, of a divorce. And I was making choices about what I wanted to do with the next phase of my life. And I had this one point of decision. Oh, by the way, they told the company that I was working for, so I also had like lost my job and <laughs> was just, you know, in the middle of just a lot of personal turmoil. And, you know, kind of looking at myself, I was in my early 30s and kind of like, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, how's, how's this going to work? And so um, I had, I was in the fortunate position to have sort of two different job opportunities. And one of them was 
very much, say, in the US, do consulting. It was a very logical and good and safe choice. And one was the choice to move back to Argentina, because I was there twice, move back to Argentina and earn devaluing pesos and do something that really didn't make a lot of sense for me. And I was looking at those two things, and the decision for me was, if I took the consulting job, there would be a Friday night when I would be stuck in O'Hare Airport, was snowed in, you know, not able to get home, and I'd be going, I could be in Argentina right now. And when I was in Argentina, there would never be a moment going, <laughs> I could be stuck in O'Hare right now, <laughs> you know? And so that was the moment, that was the first step. That was the first choice of this real intentional path. But I don't think I realized it then. I think I realized it a little later on that this path of making choices to be able to choose jobs, choose cities, choose careers, choose relationship arrangements that work with a lot of travel or living in different places, um, it, it, that was the first step on that path. But the realization came a couple of years later with some other choices about jobs and cities and things like that. So I think, you know, anytime I come to you with a game plan, yeah. we veer off of it pretty quickly. <laughs> so that's going to happen now. Okay. At least we're skipping he the wrote, order. He wrote some questions down, and we're going to go off track. Well, <laughs> I, I'm basically hitting them just in very different order than I told you I would. That's fine. <laughs> that, that time, um, Argentina versus Atlanta. Yeah. And this is, we're going to talk a lot more about this, because um, some of the resistance of people really being able to own their lives and figure out what it looks like. But that right now is so visceral for me. Um, th th when I say that your ideas have been bouncing in my, my brain for a year, part of those is, you know, I've told some of my students it's only in the last five years that I realize I get to choose what I do. That yeah. That's never been the case. It's always been, well, I go to college, and then I get a job, and then I, then I, then I. And for the first time ever, it's, I can do anything. Yeah. That thing that you did would petrify me. Like, I would physically freeze if I was in that situation. And probably more importantly, once I made the decision, that's not comfortable for me. And I would fall back into, well, this is a mistake. Let me go back to what I know. How did that not happen? Yeah. Um, it's scary. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that was scary. And it was sort of like, well, I didn't really have a lot of other great options. And a little bit of it is like the whole Cortez strategy. You guys remember the Cortez, the guy who had the ships and he burned the ships so people couldn't go back and leave and you had to stay. A little bit of it, that's a really bad historical <laughs> <laughs> summary of Cortez. But anyways, a little bit of that, like, you know, cut off all your other options to make this one have to work. And I think also part of it, when I was growing up, I remember a million times, you know those things that your parents always say that you remember that you've heard a lot? My dad would always say, you make a decision and then you make it the right decision. And so for me, that was a big part of it is like, okay, I am making this decision to choose one thing over something else. And then I'm going to put all of my energy effort into making it the right decision. And so I'm going to use all of my resources, energy, whatever, instead of going back and thinking about that other decision and just trying to make that decision the right decision. I love that. Have you always had that? That, that, that idea of well, like a, I've had that voice <laughs> in my head my whole life. Yes. Have you always believed that voice? Um, I think that it's been really helpful for me. And I haven't been a person who's gone back and questions lots of decisions. Obviously, there are you know, questions that have gone back and looked at. But I think that having that framework of you're always going forward and kind of evolving and changing and embracing whatever that next phase is going to be about has been an important part of it. Yeah. That's, that's, I love that. So with that, let's get back on track okay. um, because all of this is tied into kind of what the premises I say of, of your book, but I don't want to trivialize this, that this is just some little, you know, side part of you that you put together. One of the things that I, I it was absolutely amazing to me is, um, again, knowing you, knowing how I perceive you and just from us having, you know, talking over drinks. <laughs> I, I know that this is kind of a part and parcel with you, but if you ask me to get this into words, like summarize who you are, no chance. And when you sent it to me and I read it, it was, oh my God, she did it in like less than 200 pages, mm -hmm. which is astounding. Um, and it was, it was just really impactful for me to see at least one essence of you distilled down into this way that was helpful for me and, and helpful for other people. Could you give everyone kind of what that premise is? Yeah. So, um, so with the book, and um, the, the book really started because I was in my office one day, and I'm just like having some coffee, and I'm typing away, and 
just you know doing emails or whatever you do regularly on a boring office afternoon. And all of a sudden, one of my best friends from work comes in, and he is ranting and ra- he's this very large man, ranting and raving and waving his arms all over the place. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? And he's like, that guy's winning and we're losing. And he's like stomping around my office. He's winning and we're losing. And I'm like looking up from my computer like, what are you talking about? And so he, he goes, he goes, our CEO, our CEO's executive compensation had been announced that day. And it was obviously a number that was much larger than the number that he and I were receiving in terms of compensation. So CEO is obviously making a lot more money than my colleague was and a lot more money than I was. And he's like, he's winning and we're losing. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about because I'm winning. And he paused and he froze and he looked at me and he goes, what do you mean you're winning? (laughs) And I said, I'm not playing the game of who makes the most money. I'm playing the game of who gets to spend the most amount of time in the coolest places around the world. And I'm winning. And he looked at me and he goes, that's brilliant. You should write a book. <laughs> and, so, and so that was kind of the, that was the genesis of it. But I started thinking about it and the depth of it is we are all so culturally conditioned in how we define and measure success and what a successful like, life looks like. And you're supposed to go to college and you're supposed to get a job and you're supposed to get married and you're supposed to have a house and you're supposed to have kids and you have fancy cars and you do this and you do that and you vacation in the right places and all this kind of stuff. And that's what you're supposed to do. And if you're not careful, that whole, your whole life sort of gets sent down that path. And then you wake up and have a midlife or a quarter life crisis and you go, what am I doing? And why am I doing all of this, right? Who am I doing this for? And is this really what I want to be doing? And so the premise of the book is get aware of your cultural conditioning and all these ways that you've been taught to measure success and then start thinking about which ones you actually want to accept and which ones you want to get rid of and just let go of and do things the way you want to do them. Play your game instead of playing someone else's game. And playing a game that you can win instead of playing a game that you're probably going to lose at, like who makes the most money in the world, right? So why don't you, why don't you frame your own game and make it about your own choices But doing that requires you to be aware of your conditioning, aware of all those voices in your head that may or may not be your own, (laughs) and start sort of getting the courage to start on that path to define the way you want to live your life instead of doing what everyone else says you're supposed to be doing. So those conditioning pieces, I think one thing when people hear cultural conditioning, they tend to to think one thing, but when you actually get into that, I'll say the science, although I think both of us are armchair uh, psychiatrists. We're armchair neuroscientists <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's psychologists, right. yes. And we both think we're very, very intelligent when we talk to each other <laughs> <laughs> until we talk to a real science, at least me, yes. until I talk to a real one. Yeah, but, <laughs> and you're like, I know, no- I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think for people that, that don't understand, I'll say some of the science behind it, but but actually what your brain is doing, the, the just nuts and bolts of, no, 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 cultural conditioning yeah. is nothing more, nothing less than boom. Can you kind of give everyone an idea of what that thing is that that our brains are doing? Yeah. Yeah. So, and again, not a neuroscientist. (laughs) I've read a lot of, I've read a lot of articles, but not a neuroscientist. But basically what happens is, and, and if you think about this, you think about when you're a little kid and you're taught that some things are good and some things are bad. And some of it's because you don't want to get burned by touching the stove or, you know, there are other things that adults are telling you to do or not to do to try to keep you safe and, and, and keep you growing and healthy. Um, and you learn what's good and what's bad. And then you get into school and you start learning what's good and what's bad. And people start teaching you um, how you're supposed to behave and you're not supposed to kick kids on the playground. And people start putting gender into it around five or six years old of what girls do and what boys do. And then you get into middle school and it's about what kind of grades are you getting and who are your friends and are you part of the cool kids or not. And you get into high school and it's about your relationships with different people. And then you get into college and it's about what you're going to study and what your GPA is. And then you go and you get a job and it's, you know, and so it's all of this kind of training that is part of your cultural conditioning that goes on and it's reinforced Um, You know, there's sort of positive reinforcements and negative reinforcements if you want. Um, But so what happens is your brain really likes when 
people are saying, hey, good job, way to go, and squirts out all fun chemicals to, to make you feel good and happy, right? And when you do something wrong, your brain squirts out all of the scary chemicals, your adrenaline and stuff of, oh gosh, I might be unsafe and I might be in danger. And so what happens over time is you know what kinds of behaviors are going to lead other people to encourage you and say, good job, way to go. And then over time, you know which ones are going to get you in trouble and make you feel those bad feelings, right? So what's really going on when you're trying to do something against what you've been trained and when you're trying to do something different than what other people expect is your brain starts having a little freak out. And by the way, when you don't do something that other people expect, their brains have little freak outs too, because you're not doing what they expect. And then all of a sudden you're freaking out and then you retreat and go, never mind, I'll just do the regular thing because it's safer, right? And so that's your brain trying to keep you safe and all of that. And so that's really what was fascinating to me when I started learning about all of this and studying and reading and a lot of our conversations led to it too, of like, this is sort of a brain process trying to keep me in line based on all of these influences and factors that are telling me to define success a certain way and live a certain kind of life and pursue certain indicators of success, the kind of house you live in, the car you drive, whatever. Um, and how do I peel back from that? And how do I deal with those little, I call them my little monsters. How do I deal with those little monsters when they start coming up and get away from that fear part and those little monsters and get into my brain part and my rational thinking part to be able to move forward on a path that's comfortable for me. And the little monsters part is actually one of the most fun parts. And in the book, I drew all the pictures in the book. There are like worksheets and pictures. I'm actually very proud of those because I'm not an artist. But there are pictures of my little monsters and what they look like in my head now in the book. And the little monsters, I had to kind of convert them from being these like scary, gruesome demons to looking like those little cartoon monsters and Monsters, Inc., you know? And so now when they <laughs> pop up, I'm like, oh, hello, cute little monster. Like, I've got this. You can go back. It's safe. And I can start acting like a rational, mature adult again, right? So one of the, you, uh, it's someone else's quote, but you had it in the book. And I, mm -hmm. I loved it when I came across it. It was, we're not educated, we're trained. Yes. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the heart of, of you know, if you kind of distill down everything in, in, in our quasi-neuroscientific uh, <laughs> conversations, yes. it's that. And so I think the, um, the aha moment for me, and, and uh, full disclosure, I present her thoughts as if they're my own to about 400 MBA students a year. I, I do cite her, but, <laughs> but they think I'm very clever when I tell them this. <laughs> and they say it's very impactful when I tell them this. Um, this idea that... Normally, think of an MBA program. The, the, you know, the stereotype and, in, in some ways, the reality of you are learning the steps to take to succeed at a very specific game, the, the game of business, right? That itself is built within the, yeah, but that's because you're trained that this is the right thing to do. You can completely put that aside and say, I get to choose all the rules. I get to choose what success looks like. I get to redefine those points. Yes. And it's that that is so powerful. But one of the kind of negative spaces of that is it basically says you get to choose where you lean, what you want to do. But to do that, you have to choose what not to do. Yes. Which is the very long way of saying you, you can't have it all. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this is what's hard, right? This is what's hard because we're all, uh, this whole like have it all conversation, I sort of exited that conversation quite a few years ago because I, I remember thinking, why would you want it all? Like, why wouldn't you just want what you want, not what everyone else says you're supposed to want? And so when I started having those moments is when I kind of exited the have it all conversation that has gone on for a long time. But when I think about it, I think, yeah, you get to choose what game you play which means there are other games that you're not going to play. Um, but recognizing that it's your choice, and if you choose the game that really works well for you, then it's not that hard to give up all that other stuff that you're not going after because it's really about what you need to be doing, not what someone else is, is trying to tell you to do. So, But I'm going to be honest because I'm human, right? And so I... And not perfect, and I make a lot of mistakes. And there are times when, you know, I will see social media is the worst. 
So there's a time I'll see stuff on social media and somebody's in a vacation in a better place than mine and that obviously makes me kind of angry. <laughs> and, and, you know, or I'll see something about someone winning something or doing something or, and I'll kind of like that little jealousy thing will pop up and I'll be like, God, why, why did they get that promotion and not this other person or not me or whatever? I'll get those feelings that come up. And then usually it'll take like a day or two to go, you didn't want that anyway. <laughs> Why were you upset about it? You didn't want that anyway. That's just your conditioning come back telling you you were supposed to want it. But even if you had it, you wouldn't really want it. And so I feel like this whole have it all conversation and having everything really has to do with like those things that you were trained to want. And then if you get really, really honest with yourself, there's probably like some of them that you don't want anyway. But they keep getting thrown back in my face, at least. It's the universe testing me or whatever. They keep getting thrown back in my face to like check, is this really what you want? Are you sure? Are you sure you don't want something else? And it's the opportunity to me, for me to go back and check in with myself of, am I really doing what I want and how I want it? And um, in a way that makes sense for me. You know, so I, I feel like those are when that whole have it all conversation is the opportunity to say, what do you really want? And is it all of that stuff? And if it is great, organize your life, go for it. But if it's not, figure out like what it is and put your focus there and then try to um, block out all of the noise that's going to keep getting thrown at you about things that you don't actually want. So let's talk about some of that noise. Yes. Um, I want to talk through... On, on one hand, this is so obvious that, you know, you just go, of course, like, of course I need to be choosing what's this. And, and yet every person I've ever had read the book, every person I've talked to this idea about, including myself, it's wait, what? Like I, I actually get to make this decision. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, so much of it comes from those voices in your head. And for me, one of the first one, you know, as I was kind of trying to recognize why is it so hard for me? Because I'm still even, you know, kind of trying to go down this journey and embrace it. It's really hard for me. One of the ones that comes up, and you kind of said the words, well, in order to not have everything, you have to decide, I want what I want. And that's what I'm going to go for. There's a part of me that goes, oh, but that's selfish. And there's a part of me that when I read your book, I say, I should be a chef. Like, I know what I love. I know what I would enjoy. I think my wife would vouch I'm pretty good at it, <laughs> I think. Um, like, that would make me happy. And then the voice goes, but your niece and nephew needs a lot of wonderful presents every Christmas, and they might need help in college, and they might need a car. And I go, good point. That would be very selfish for me to, to go and pursue this thing that I love. How do you even start to disentangle that? Or yeah. how have you been able to disentangle yeah. that? Yeah, no, and I think, it's, I think it's really interesting too because the idea of playing your game and doing what you want doesn't necessarily require selfishness. You can put other people at the center of your game. I have a really good friend of mine and he has two daughters and he never went to college until much later in his life and his wife now is starting college and their thing is their two daughters are going to go to college and break a cycle that their family has been in for a long time. And so he has put that for his daughters at the middle of everything he does and all of his choices revolve around that. So you can put other people in the middle of your game. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think part of my game is I actually, I'm actually like kind of a generous person. Like I love like time, talent, and resources and sharing that stuff with people. But I get really mad when people expect it of me because then they've turned it into an obligation and they've taken away my ability to be generous. And that's one of the things that I want to do, right? I like to be generous. Um, and so one of the things that I have in my game is how do I make sure that I'm able to be generous, but not in a way that starts making me feel bad about it because people start expecting it and, you know, that takes all the fun out of it when it's for obligation or for guilt, right? And so you can put doing things for other people in the middle of your game. You can put other people in the middle of your game, but if it's your choice about this, not because you are frustrated, guilted, um, obligated, or some other way. It's really about where is that motivation coming from. I was doing a podcast the other day, and uh, the guy who was interviewing me said 
that when he was growing up, his dad left for work before he woke up and got home about four o'clock every afternoon. And when his dad got home, his dad was so excited and talking about how great it was to be able to go and do what his job was so he could provide for his family and be there for his kid in the afternoon and spend time together. And he was so excited about this, you know, and I was speaking to the adult child who was like, this was great to have my dad there that way. And how different it would have been if the dad's message was, look at all I do for you, look how much I suffer for you, look at all of the, the sacrifices I'm making for you, and how different that would have been. And so I think it's where that motivation comes from about how you want to put other people in the middle of your game or how you want to be with other people. And if it's coming from a place that's really about who you are or if it's coming from that place of obligation, if it's coming from that place of obligation, I think you got to kind of sit back and do some layers and do some of that therapy work because I think otherwise the gift that you're giving to someone else and the way that you're interacting with them is probably not super healthy. <laughs> so speaking of therapy, I'm just going to continue this session with myself. Here's, <laughs> here's, here's another voice I have in my head. Um, another, another piece, and in, in, uh, this one I definitely have, but other people I've talked to, I think this is especially prevalent when you are uh, someone that just came out of uh, school, college especially, or someone who has a child that is recently coming out of college. Yes. The idea that the game I want to play now might not align with the game I want to play when I'm 45. And this idea that choices you make today can constrain the choices you make in the future. And to make this even more concrete, I made it, not me, but you know, someone makes a choice that the game they want to play is to be successful, to go down that corporate road, they go to college, they get a whole lot of student debt. And then they start feeling empowered to, I get to choose what makes me happy. I get to choose what my game is. I get to choose what success is. Uh-oh, what I would love and what I would want to do does not have a big paycheck. And suddenly that, you know, that becomes very difficult. Is this idea of kind of empowering yourself to make this change, is it even possible in a situation like that? For sure. And I think about student loans and I think about people who make other decisions like, to have small humans that they bring <laughs> onto the planet. You know, those are sort of big, big decisions. Yeah, so part of being a fully mature adult is being responsible for your financial life and being responsible for decisions you've made over the course of your life and rearranging your life in ways that you need to. You know, I don't think anyone ever says like, work is supposed to be a prison that you're in for your whole life, you know, just because you've got some student loans to pay. And I don't want to minimize student loans and the price of those and the importance of those, all of that. But I do think that when you are looking at your larger game and when you're looking at the pieces of the puzzle and how you want to make your life fit together, yeah, maybe you need to go get a job that's going to help you pay down those student loans for a while. And then later, you can be doing something else. Or maybe Jeremy can keep his job at Fuqua to pay the bills, but be a pop-up chef once a month and have something like that that he does that expresses that need for creativity in chef and restaurant. And who knows over time where that might go. You know, I've got one really close friend of mine who was an investment banker and earned tons of money and now did, then did commercial scuba diving in Australia and now works on a truffle farm. Great. Awesome, right? Massive shift, but he did it after he made some money, right? I've got other, another friend who she's like, okay, well, my husband and I are going to work till we're 75 because he's a high school teacher and she runs her own small business, but they're totally fine with that and they're arranging their lives in that way to pay off their bills and to live within their means and to make mature adult financial decisions. You've got to do that, but you can be creative about it. And just because you have a lot of student loans doesn't mean you can't go and also incorporate into your life other things that really make you happy and that are part of your fulfillment. And by the way, nobody ever said fulfillment has to come from your job, which I think, you know, like that, that's something <laughs> that a lot of people go, wait a second, what do you mean? Because we put so much emphasis in this culture on our jobs and on your fulfillment coming through accomplishments and accomplishments come at work, right? And so all of those things are sort of tied together in the US culture. It's not necessarily that way in other cultures. And so I think that thinking, you know, sometimes a job is just a job that makes it possible for you to go do some other things that you want to do. And I think that's a valid choice and a valid way to organize your life as long as you're doing kind of what you want to be doing and you're not um, forcing something onto someone else who has not consented to have it forced onto them. 
And by that, I mean your kid who has a lot of student loans who now wants to live in your basement forever and never pay rent and you know, make no money, and they're requiring you to be complicit in that with them. That's not OK. That's not fully functioning human adult unless everybody in the household is super happy with that. <laughs> but that's, you, know, you can't make decisions that force someone else to do something without their consent. Right, and so I think that's the way I think about it. And I think about there's this whole like, it's not this or that. It's not pay my student loans or live a fulfilling life. You've got to figure out how you get both of those things involved and, and pieced together. I think one of my students pointed out one way of looking at this, which definitely resonated with me. And, and again, one of those, yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? Was that you? You shouldn't pick your job and then figure out how to make your life fulfilling. Yeah. You should, and I think that's kind of the heart of, of yeah. your premise. Yeah. You should figure out what makes your life fulfilling and then figure out the job right. that gets you there. Right. And for me, that was that that was eye opening. Well, you make the job, but then also like the other kinds of choices. And so I think about. So I, I was laughing the other day because I handed my phone to someone who was 22 <laughs> to take pictures of this podcast I was doing, and they couldn't figure out my phone. I have an iPhone six. <laughs> okay, my phone is ancient, <laughs> but it works for me. And the idea of getting another iPhone is the very last thing on my list that I care about. <laughs> there are 8 million other things that I care about, and I will use my iPhone 6 until it is dead, and then I will buy whatever other one I have to buy at that point, right? The kind of car that I choose to drive. I drive a Prius. I love my <laughs> Prius. My Prius is awesome. But most people are like, why don't you get a fancier car? My Prius is two and a half years old and has 5,000 miles on it. I don't want another car. I want my Prius, and that's the way I want to be. And so I think what happens is a lot of people start going, oh, well, I have to have this, and I have to have that, and I have to have the other thing, and I have to have the other thing. And then you run out of space. But if you go, well, I don't need the new iPhone every year, or I don't need a fancy car, or whatever it is that's not important to you, if those things are important to you, there's something else that's not you start structuring around that, but it's going back to what you really care about, not what other people are saying is important. So kind of flipping this in the other direction, um, one, I think you, you've really kind of you know, positioned a way that no matter where you are, as long as you think of the longer form game, there's a way to get there and a way to put everything together. But flipping it in terms of the, the kind of mental freak outs of the people that love you. <laughs> Um, that it, it's in some ways, you know, very difficult to get out of toxic relationships, but in some ways easy because you can go, oh, after the fact, that was definitely wrong. I think where it's really hard is it's someone that you know loves you and they're disappointed in you. Oh. Where what their view of what their game they, they are playing, your moves are not winning in. How do, you, how do you handle that? How do you handle that as the person that is getting, maybe not judged, but having advice from a loving place and how do you handle that on the other side in a way that can be supportive, but also kind of thinks about that future option role? Yeah, that's real. And that's real. Um, I remember this is way oversharing. I don't know why it just popped into my head. The moment my parents were probably most disappointed in me ever. <laughs> and it was like in high school and I came home like pretty drunk and <laughs> it was a whole scene and they weren't even, uh -huh. they, didn't even yeah. <laughs> they didn't even ground me, but they just were so disappointed that it was worse than being grounded, <laughs> right? So that disappointment thing is real and it's heavy and it's it's there. But then I sit back and I go, okay, couple of thoughts about disappointment. Sometimes that disappointment is, and I don't say this for 16-year-olds, now let's talk about adults, okay? 16-year-olds, <laughs> I think it's a little different because the role of a parent is very important for a 16-year-old. Um, but if you're thinking about adult to adult, um, you're disappointed in me because I didn't do what you thought I should have been doing, which maybe isn't respecting me as who I am and what I need to be doing. And so I go back to Khalil Gibran. I don't know how many of you read the book, The Prophet, but it's awesome. And there's a chapter in there, and it's called On Children. And it says they come through you, but they don't come from you. And it basically says your job as a parent is to help that child become who they're supposed to be, not who you want them to be, not who you wish you were, not who you, know, not who, who you are but what they're supposed to be. And so I really embrace that in my personal life and personal philosophy when I think about friendships and I think about relationships and I think about family relationships, you know, sort of trying to help other people become who they're supposed to be 
through guidance, through questions, you know, helping them frame up choices and then supporting them that them in that choice, even if I think that was a really dumb thing to do. <laughs> but I'll support you in that choice and I'll never tell you I told you so if it blows up in your face. I'll say, okay, well, now where are we going to go? Now what are you going to do? And now how can I help you rethink the situation or how can I help support you in this moment where you're going through some other situation? So I think for me it's that whole idea of healthy relationships of becoming who you are and helping other people become who they are and finding people in your life who support you in your path and your journey. And that's sometimes the hardest part because sometimes the people that we're born into a house with aren't necessarily the ones who are going to be most supportive of helping us on our journey. And so that's where I think it's really important to um, find other kinds of support who are going to be helpful. So there's two parts of that I want to touch on. And again, I'm completely off the rails now. My apologies. Um, (laughs) The idea of um, helping someone to find where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Have you ever given any thought on how to help somebody find the way, you know, find where they're supposed to go in a way that's natural to them? You know, especially I'm thinking young, you know, teenage children um, where the sky's the limit. Um, Have you given any thought to what that looks like on, on helping someone foster this I don't know, this find who you are idea. Yeah, yeah. And part of it, I mean, some of it's like some of the worksheets in the book about what do people want from you and for you and what do you want from yourself and for yourself. But some of it is just that helping people frame choices. And for me, when I talk about framing choices, it's that whole and not or, or it's, okay, you want to go down that path of, I was talking earlier, someone I know their kid is a professional video game player. Okay, I didn't know this was a thing until I met this person. Oh, but their, yeah. kid makes, their kid makes $60,000 a year as a professional video game player and lives in some house that's paid for. And I was like, "What? this is a thing? Yeah, he <laughs> plays this position on Fortnite. I'm like, what? Anyway, crazy. So, But when, he, when, when the conversation was going on with this, with this kid, this boy, um, you know, okay, so what are the, like, help project what the evolution of that life might look like and help think through what are some of the things you might want to cover for or have in place to ensure that that path is a good one for you, like good food and exercise and sleep. I don't know if your job is to play video games. I would think those things are kind of important to incorporate into your day somehow, you know, or thinking about what are you going to do after this because I don't know how long a career of a professional video game player lasts. I I don't know. You know, so framing up questions to help them think through what that might look like. And I think that's what's important. And I think you can do that when kids are really young. So I don't have kids, um, but I was a nanny for five summers, which I think is why I don't have kids. (laughs) (laughs) Because I learned at a very early age that having kids is really hard, Uh, like really hard. Um, One of them's a lawyer, one of them's a doctor. You know, they're all grown up now, and I'm very proud of the small part I played in that, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) But but it was a lot of like screaming about the hot dog that was overcooked in the microwave (laughs) and whatever. And so, um, so, you know, but I did see even at that age, you've got sets of choices that you can make. And as a child gets older and you can sort of expand that circle of choices and that's how you can help get this thinking sort of more built in instead of a line of thinking, which is you sort of always do what everyone expects you to do. And then all of a sudden you're 25 going, I really don't know what to do, right? So it's that framing of choices that I think is important. So here, here's the other thing that you said that I actually want to push on more because it's one of the braver things I think you talked about in, in the book. The idea that sometimes not just the relationships in your family might not be the right relationships to help you be who you need to be, but even more broadly. And I know you talked a little bit about you having to come to the realization that even some friends you had, yeah. they weren't they couldn't be on this journey as yeah. much as you wanted them to. Um, can you kind of talk about what what that looks like, what it feels like, how hard that is? Yeah, it's super hard. So I um, I remember there, there was like, you know, those moments where you just have like a click in your life. I was sitting on this balcony um, having brunch one day with a bunch of people, and I was looking around, and I was just like, 
I gotta get some better friends. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> these are just not good people that I'm sitting around Sunday brunch with. And I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody, but just all of a sudden I'm yes. like, what am I doing with these people, <laughs> right? And it was just this moment of like, oh my God. So then I started talking about Saturday friends and Sunday friends. Right, and it's always really easy to find a bunch of Saturday night friends, but it's a lot harder to find good Sunday friends, right? And so I started thinking about Saturday friends and Sunday friends, and how do you? And some of them, R- real quick, some of them overlap. Are, are, are Sunday friends, the one that'll help you, like with your yard. Yeah, the Sunday friends okay. are the ones that will be there and support you. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah, like gotcha. Sunday friends are the ones that are are, are going to be supportive and there for you, kind of like family. Um, but so you know, I remember thinking. Um, you know, how do you, how do you find those kinds of Sunday friends? And it is, it was this whole process. And, you know, there were some people I just completely cut out of my life because I was like, this is toxic and unhealthy and has to go. And then there were other relationships where I was like, okay, this person is great to hang out with for certain things, but I need to kind of turn the volume down on some other things. Um, So to be really concrete about that, I had one friend who was a really, really good friend, but all she wanted was for me to get married again and have kids so we could all be married together and have kids together. And it was like, (laughs) and so I was like, all right, I really want to hang out with her for some things. We were like workout friends and stuff. So, okay, that's great. But we got to turn the volume down on the other part of that relationship. And then there were other people where I was like, all right, I need to go find some people who are living the kind of life that I envision myself to be living in the future and surround myself with more of them. And so finding people who had lived in multiple places, finding people who had, um, you know, had these weird, crazy experiences riding horses in Patagonia, you know, and I don't know, getting seasick on a boat in Hong Kong and throwing up all afternoon, you know, all of these other like wonderful, horrible things, you know, people who had had those kinds of experiences or knew what it was like to live in two languages, um, you know, and, and the struggle of having two languages going in and out of your brain and just being exhausted because you're trying to figure out what the heck is going on, you know. So people who knew those kinds of, of experiences and who were sort of on more creative paths or creative careers, and how do I bring them into my life? And so I started getting a lot more intentional about who I was spending my time with and how I was how I was bringing different kinds of people or different kinds of experiences to me to get that kind of support that I needed. So I want to ask you one more thing, and then we'll turn it over for Q and A. Just kind of the, the the broad one. Looking back at all of this and, and making this intentional shift, what's been the hardest thing for you? Oh my God, the judgment and the fear and the criticism and the exhaustion and all the voices <laughs> that roll around in my head going. You know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, that, that, that part is what is hard, right? And um, one of the things that I really hate, I've read a bunch of self-help books, and, you know, a lot of them are like, well, if you just do this one thing, it's super easy <laughs> and magically everything's perfect. And I would read the book and I'd be like, it is not magically perfect, and it is not fast. It is a slow process to get to a place where you're good with what is going on with your life and you've you've chosen and you've organized it and you've gone forward. And so I think for me, like, the hardest part has been um, knowing what I want, getting that definition of what I want as opposed to all those other things other people want and then getting support from people who will help me in the pursuit of that and sort of, you know, I have the one friend I call when I need to justify buying the pair of shoes, and I have the other friend I, I call when I need to not justify buying the pair of shoes. And, you know, getting the right kind of support in your life in the right kind of ways and the right kinds of moments. And then really that relationship with yourself of, you know, this is, I am doing this for me and I'm doing this my way. And I have all of these amazing people in my life that are accompanying me in this, but it's, you know, I'm being true to myself. And so my interactions with them are genuine and real and healthy. Um, but kind of staying on that path because it's really easy to get diverted um, in some other direction. And I'll say one of the things that you're kind of my spirit animal on is using your words. Is I, I remember when you first sent me an advanced copy of your book, and I asked you, I'm like, what are you looking for here? Are you looking for you know me to give feedback or like criticism? And you said, nope, where I am right now, I just want the positive support. We'll get to the rest later. <laughs> and I said, perfect. Like, perfect. <laughs> like, Which is great. Yeah. So, so can I, I just need to tell that for one second, and then we'll do Q&A. Um, so one of the funniest things, and this, you know, I was writing the book, and I shared it with a couple of people, like my sister, right? And I was like, 
tell me good things about <laughs> this book. Because I was afraid, you know, it's really, it's really challenging to take some artistic, creative, personal thing and put it out there in front of other people and go, what do you think? I mean, that's dangerous, right? Talk about your brain freaking out. That's dangerous. And so I gave it to my sister. I was like, tell me, tell me that it's good. <laughs> She's like, it's good. I'm like, okay. And so then I started giving it to some other people, but I said, only tell me what you like about it, okay? And this one friend of mine um, got it, and they said, okay, I'm getting on an airplane right now. I'll tell you what I think. I can't just tell you what I like because I have to be honest. Turn their phone off. <laughs> they woke up after the flight to a text message probably <laughs> this long from me of like, you don't know how to be a good friend. <laughs> I told you what I needed, and you know, and I need you to tell me what's good, or just don't even read it at all. I don't even freaking care. You know, it was like one of those long ranty text messages because I was like, I told you what I needed, and I trusted you to be close enough to me to respect that. And then he was like, Oh my god. <laughs> so anyway, I was like, Fine. So so I shared it with with some people close to me, and then I shared it with a broader circle, and I said, Tell me what you like. And then tell me what you want to have more of in the book, like where it needs to be supplemented. All right, now this group, tell me what you like and tell me what doesn't make sense. You know, start getting a little critical. Okay, this group. But I did it in a very intentional way, and I was kind of proud of myself for that because I think normally we just go, here it is, what do you think? And I needed that process to build up my confidence and to build up my... Um, I don't know, my, my strength to be able to open myself up to, to criticism. And I actually love that you respected me enough to be vulnerable with me. Yeah. Say, nope, this is, this is all I'm, this right. is I'm I was at. like, that was person. it. And then someone who like respects boundaries goes, okay, that's all I'm going to do. And then later he's like, ah, well, you know. Like, okay. <laughs> I said, if you want <laughs> to. Yeah, I know. Clear. I was like, tell me three. Don't tell <laughs> yeah. me. <laughs> and I sandwiched it. You asked for that too. <laughs> anyway. Sandwiched it. Yeah. yeah, but that's important about knowing yourself and like couching things in that way. And I think just one thing, and then we'll, we'll do q and I think one of the things that's really important when I think about this group and the opportunity that everyone here has with each other and with the rest of the, the, the weekend, one of the things that I think is really important is to think about that. And, you know, when I, when I came to Duke from a little tiny small town and this place was so intimidating, it still is in a lot of ways, right? So intimidating. You have all these like really amazing people. I show up and there are like all these people from like Manhattan and I don't even know what that is. And, you know, they all seem so cosmopolitan and sophisticated and my little town is not cosmopolitan or sophisticated, and it was really intimidating. And sometimes I think there was so much emphasis on the accomplishment piece and some competitiveness and, and sort of this, this focus on achievement, and it was really hard. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about how do you get more engagement of more people and how do you make the most out of this weekend, it really is thinking about how do you show all of that? How do you show the messy and the complicated, not just the achievement? How do you show that everybody goes through, I call it, how do you destigmatize perceived imperfection, right? And thinking about how in your programming you can destigmatize perceived imperfection and you can show models of people who are on different paths and you can have speakers who are teachers and public servants and um, startup founders and you know people who aren't just doing business executive stuff. You can have different kinds of... Um, of models of success and show that. And that's a way of being more inclusive and bringing more people into the conversation. And then I think you can also, you know, everybody goes through those life phases where you're like, what is going on? <laughs> and so having that be more part of the dialogue of what is this crazy phase of life about and what's going on and how do you pull from the strength of experiences of other people in very non-judgmental ways to be able to help guide and coach people through phases. Sometimes it's really intimidating to go, I've got this really big problem and issue, can you help me with it? So figuring out how to structure that in a way might be, might be um, really interesting for this group to talk about. Questions? Yeah, and I think we have a microphone yeah, floating around. Yeah, somebody's got microphones, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, please be careful. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I like the illustration. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Marie Asti. I'm 
Duke Nursing 2008. Awesome. I read the book on the plane today, so I really did like the illustrations. <laughs> um, and I guess a question I had is, do you have strategies for when you perhaps have some regrets on not pursuing like a, the more conventional or time sensitive games that like people play? Because like you were saying earlier, there's like the Facebook, the Twitter, like eventually like you may enjoy the game you pursued or liked parts of it, but like there was another game going on and you can't join it yeah. after it's already completed. Right, exactly. So the the first premise of that, and, and depending on the context, so I'm probably going to lift out a little bit from, from whatever example is, is in your mind, but, you know, I feel like there's, there's no option that's really cut off ever. I mean, I guess like, you know, I missed the concert the other night or the game the other night, but for big life things, you know, there's really no time limit I think on things, and that's something that's been a gift that I've been learning as I'm getting older uh, and looking back. I'm like, there, you know, there are some things maybe, but 90% of what's going on in the world is stuff that you can participate in. There's no time limit on it, right? And I think that's pretty amazing and pretty empowering in a way to take the pressure off of yourself when you feel like you did miss something, right? Um, but I think that that frustration that comes up or that fear of missing out or that, you know, potential regret, I think that's real. But what I usually do is go back and go, okay, what's this really about? Is it because I missed out on something that looked really cool? Okay, well, I miss out on a lot of stuff that looks cool and I do a lot of stuff that's cool for me. So, you know, I can kind of rationalize it that way. But I really send it back and go, what is this really telling me about myself? And what's the message here that I need to listen to? Um, is it telling me, you know, is that feeling that I'm having saying, hey, you need to start pursuing something else or working on some other issue or, you know, figuring things out. So to, again, to try to make that more concrete, um, you know, if there is a, so I, I'm into art and design. I love art and design stuff. And so there's this one artist that I think is super cool. He's a Senegalese photographer. And, um, you know, I've like, I've gone to some of his exhibits in different places and sort of will follow around to see where, what work he's doing. And so it's like, okay, well, what is it about that that's attracting me? You know, what is it about that that is pulling me? What does that tell me I need to be learning or doing some introspection or whatever? So I usually use those opportunities of like, what is this telling me? about is there something I need to pursue? Is there a, you know, a passion that I need to pursue or a cause I need to work on? Or, but it's more about how I'm reacting to it than it is about the fact that I missed out on it. Does One other sense? thing. Yeah. These are your words, so I feel okay uh, saying great. them. Otherwise, I'm going to sit here quietly. <laughs> but uh, some of my students asked you before Ooh. when we did one of these, um, pretty much you said what you, what you just said. And the idea is, well, if I'm here and I suddenly realize I want to go over here, you know, if I'm 35, if I'm 40, how, how does that happen? And your point was, you don't go there, you go here. Right. And then you go here, and then you go here, and then, and you know what? You might realize here, oh, I want to go over there now. Yeah. But when you have the long game in mind of, okay, so I want to do that, so it's going to take me 10 years. So that means I got to get here and two, and then there, and there, and there. It makes it a much less daunting piece. And yeah. that one, a lot of our students, like, it really, it really made them go, oh, oh, yeah, okay, anything is possible. Yeah, whoever said that was really smart. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Question. I think a mic's coming behind you. And if you could start by telling everyone who you are. Naomi Shapiro from Philadelphia. Thank you for being here. No, thank um, you. I guess I'm interested to understand how you define failure and whether or not you believe you've ever failed or do you just look at things as you have no time limit, so therefore if you compartmentalize things, eventually you'll hit the goal and you'll never have that view. Yeah, no, I've definitely fallen on my face <laughs> so many times. Um, and I actually write some, like I was giving a professional presentation on a panel one time and started crying. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean like, oh my God. <laughs> like, and like, just like got frustrated and it just, and there was no, it wasn't like, oh, my allergies are out. <laughs> it was like, I'm like, crying and I have to excuse myself and then I have to actually like walk back in and look at all these people in the face again. Yeah, I consider that. That was like one of them um, I can, and the reasons behind that. Um, I, I used to do stand-up comedy. Oh man, there's <laughs> nothing 
like failing in stand-up comedy. I would talk about dating as a 40-year-old white lady in Hong Kong, and, um, <laughs> at, which is fascinating. Um, and there would be like two women cracking up in the front row and all the men were like dead silent. <laughs> and it was like, okay, well, I got an audience of two right now, <laughs> you know? Um, no, but I've had, I've had other sort of, um, I've had other failures for sure in my life and things that didn't go the way I wanted to or disappointments that, you know, I kind of go out, it should have been different. And I guess as, you know, you get older, you sort of do that rationalization. Well, if I hadn't done this, then this wouldn't have happened. And you sort of get to a place of resolution about it, but it doesn't take away that sting of that failure in that moment or that, that feeling of, you know, disappointment in yourself or frustration um, you know, you sort of just get to that point of, of resolution about it. Um, but I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, everything happens for a reason. It's great. No, some stuff is just a mess, and there's no reason, and you don't have to learn, and it just never should have happened, and it's part of life, and sometimes life is amazing, and sometimes it's horrible. <laughs> and, you know, just keep, just keep moving. Just keep going. And do the work to get that resolution and that sense of internal peace about it. That's about all you can hope for. Other I don't know if that's what, <laughs> I don't know if that was uplifting or not, but that's kind of, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marta, Hi, Marta. Uh, Drake, Marta Perez Drake from DC. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I'm a 92 grad, so Wait. we're both turning 50 very yes. soon. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> suffering from a midlife crisis. So this it was awesome. This was perfect. I wanted to ask you, uh, because we're in an all-women's group, yeah. how does your message resonate with different kinds of groups? And not only just women, but also different cultures. Yeah. So, and, and, and I appreciate that you've traveled and lived on four different continents. So how does cultural, you know, there's cultural conditioning and then there's real cultural conditioning um, and gender conditioning. Yeah. How do, how, what, what have you noticed? Oh, that's a big one. Okay, first of all, I'm so excited to turn 50 in a year or so. Um, I, like, honestly, for real, when I turned 40, I was like, this is awesome. And 40s were amazing. And I have this expectation that 50s are going to be even better. And I always tell everyone that I think your 20s are just sort of like running, running, doing what you think you're supposed to be doing. Your 30s, in my experience, is when your crash comes. And a lot of people I know in their early 30s are like, what <laughs> is going on? Right? And so that's that moment where you're like, whoa, this is not as easy as everyone made it look or made me think. And then your 40s, I think part of it in your 40s is you've gotten through your 30s. But then I think part of it in your 40s is also you just start caring less about what other people think. And that's why I'm so excited about 50, because I think then you just care even less. <laughs> and you just, got, you just got to keep caring less. And that's what's awesome about it. Um, so, to the, so to the question about... Um, about how people have received the message. One of the biggest surprises, and this is, it's hard to, it's hard to generalize, but one of the biggest surprises to me, um, definitely sort of that late 20, early 30 women group in the US have really resonated with this because I think that's kind of the years when you're, you're grappling with a lot of the big life choices that depending on which way you go, they might cut off other life choices. Um, but a lot of like 28 to 30 whatever year old men have also really resonated with this book, which was a total surprise for me and the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so total surprise. But I think it's because like, I think as women, we have more versions of success that are sort of societally acceptable. And I think men still have like more limited definitions of success that are acceptable. And so I think like a younger generation of men are open to and interested in that idea. And so I think that was, that was kind of a big learning and interesting. And then the other big interesting learning in the US was like people in their 60s, 65, they've also really gravitated to this book. And so I think what it really is, is it's something about, I'm going into a phase, what, the, what is this phase about now? And how is this, um, how do I want this part of my life to be, right? And so if you think about different phases of your life, um, that's another one where you can start getting really intentional about what you want your life to be. 
in different cultures. This book was written really for an American audience. Um, and we are very individualistic and the notion of a game. We're also like kind of competitive. So that idea of like you play a game and you get to win a game is something that resonates more in an American individualistic culture than it resonates in some other cultures. So that was on purpose. Um, and so, you know, with some of the people from other cultures, it tends to be younger groups that are more sort of internationalized in terms of their upbringing. Um, who, who grasp it or ones who spent their time traveling around, spent some time in the West, et cetera. Um, but that's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So sorry for those that still have questions. I think we're out of time. Um, if I know Robin, she'll probably be hanging around and would love to talk to you afterwards yeah. as long as you would like. Yes. Um, I would like to thank you for letting me do this. Thank it, you. It, I always have a blast. So thank you for this. Thank you.